What does the scouter say about his- Hi pal, nice to meet you. It's over 9,000! So I wanted to go ahead and give the top three evidences, geologically, of Noah's Flood. Mother of God. The first one is just mountains. You can look at mountain ranges and see that they were formed catastrophically and very quickly through rapid plate tectonic shifts. Now, if you notice the rock layers on these pictures, they are bent rock. Now, you cannot bend hard rock. And so what that means is that when these mountains were forming, that they were soft and moist, and this is sediment that was being laid down, and plate tectonics pushed it up into place, and then it solidified in that position. And so we see mountain ranges all over the United States and all over the world, in fact, of complete bent rock that shows that they formed very rapidly. Of course, Matt Powell gives no references to the images he's showing that are supposedly in favor of his claim. So my ass has to reverse image search each of the folds he's presented in his video to figure out where they're actually coming from. And when I did that, I found something fun. And so what that means is that when these mountains were forming, that they were soft and moist, and this is sediment that was being laid down. The first image here is of Pang La Pass, and I apologize for mispronouncing that. It is a spot in Nepal, Tibet, China area that gives you a good view of the Mount Everest and the Himalayan mountain ranges. Funny part about the Himalayan mountain ranges and Mount Everest, below the very top layers is metamorphic rock, and sometimes highly metamorphized rock. Meaning, it's not sedimentary rock. The very first image Matt Powell shows proving Noah's Flood is that all these mountain folds of sedimentary rock is of metamorphic rock. But wait! There's more! The second picture he shows, this beautiful fold at King Oscar Fjord in Greenland, is in Greenland. And you know what Greenland is dominated by? Metamorphic rock. Again, the first two images from his video about how folds are sedimentary, therefore that means Noah's Flood, are metamorphic rock. The third and fourth images he showed of folding are sedimentary rock. So, does this mean he did his research? No. Matt Powell obviously googled folded rock and just took pictures he liked. He didn't do any actual searching to figure out what he was talking about, he just found rocks that met his criteria. Today I don't feel like doing anything. Now if evolution were true, and according to the evolutionist perspective, these mountains slowly formed through plate tectonics, well I'm sorry, the rocks simply would have crumbled, they would have broken, they would not have bent. Why would the rocks crumble and break? Do you have a reason for that? Or is it just common sense? Sorry to say it, Matt Powell, your common sense doesn't work on a geologic time scale. That's the point. And if your argument was true, that all the rock in the world was folded kind of simultaneously during Noah's Flood, because it was all malleable enough to take this fold, what consistency would that rock have been at? Remember, igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary rock have all been folded. So, what is this magical level of malleability that every single layer that's been folded simultaneously was in during Noah's Flood that allowed to take this form? Obviously, if it was too soft, it would have kept its form. And according to you, if it was too hard, it would have cracked. So, what is that? How hard does a sandstone need to be to be folded versus a shale, versus a limestone, versus a chert, versus a nice, versus a quartzite, versus literally every type of rock out there. What about banded iron formation? How soft was that banded iron formation when it was folded? What about microfolds? Those exist. Another reason that we know that the flood of Noah is a fact is because if you look at coal seams across the world sandwiched between the layers of sediment, you'll actually find that they contain identical amounts of carbon-14 inside of each one. Now, carbon-14 only lasts 50,000 years. So you would expect if a layer formed slowly and another layer formed slowly over millions of years that you would actually find no carbon-14 in the bottom layers and less and less as you move up. But in the catastrophic uh, plate tectonic flood model, you find uh, and you would predict 
to find identical amounts of C14 in all of the coal seams sandwiched between the layers. And sure enough, that's what we find. It's identical amounts, which means that all of that is the same vegetation being laid down in one event. C14 and coal is an old conversation. Link below, lots of resources debunking that claim. Long story short, a combination of bad science with bad sample handling, misuse of instrumentation, and forgetting possible natural sources tears apart the creationist claim that C14 is an issue. But what really is bugging me about this claim is his all coal seams have the exact same amount of C14. Where the fuck is that claim coming from? I can't find it anywhere. It'd be nice if Matt Powell gave his sources, but that's never gonna happen, is it? I did find an article from, well, basically the four creationist geologists out there claiming that C14 to carbon ratios in some cores range from 0.1 to 0.5 PMC percent modern carbon, regardless of geologic age. But that's not saying they all have the same amount of carbon. That's saying they all have a similar cluster range. 0.1 and 0.5 are different numbers. Does Matt Powell know that? When the Earth was experiencing plate tectonic movements and the continents were moving and the fountains of the deep broke open, as the Bible says, we would predict that certain of the crust of the Earth would actually be subducted into the mantle and would cause catastrophic plate tectonic shifts. But those rocks, those slabs of cold rock, we would predict would still be in the hot mantle of the Earth. Interestingly enough, NASA had done scans on the Earth and found that there are humongous slabs of cold rock that have sunk down into the Earth. And so you have gigantic slabs of cold rock that go 400 or even 500 miles down into the mantle towards the core. And so keep in mind, it's very hot there. Well, why do we find gigantic cold slabs of rock that have not heated up over the evolutionary timescale of millions of years and become uniform with the temperature in the Earth's mantle? The cold slab issue that creationists are so hot about right now does look compelling if you don't think about it for five seconds. They keep using this image here to talk about the cold slabs and how they should be warmer. Of course, without ever describing how warm they should be, given the time scale, just say they should be warmer. Well, I don't know what I expected. But they keep using this exact image because it's the only image that backs up there idea. There are subduction zones throughout the world. Do all of these other subduction zones have the same quote-unquote cold slab issue? Well, that'd be useful to your claim, wouldn't it, creationists? But the problem is the subduction zone under China is unique, and the papers, the paper that this picture is always stolen from by creationists, explains what's going on, or at least purports a useful hypothesis. Creationists just take that, spread it all over their websites, call it a victory without doing any actual work. Again, if this was a global phenomenon in association with your global worldwide flood, maybe you'd have something. If every subduction zone throughout the world was of uniform temperature, then, hmm, interesting. Because in, in my worldview, the subduction zones are all moving at different speeds and at different rates, so we'd expect some variety throughout the world. Your view has everything happening in like a year. So, if, a, if Matt Powell was legit about this, he'd do a little bit of work, do a little bit of digging. Instead, he's just taking the most famous Cratius article he can, plastering its images all over his little video here, and not diving deeper into the concepts. This is the issue. This is Matt Powell's issue every single time. He is all flash, no substance. He doesn't think further about the points he makes. He simply makes the points because he read someplace that they are good. Cold slabs may be a talking point. It's not. 
But if Cold Slabs was to be a talking point, you need to show it as a worldwide phenomenon. Sort of like what he tried to do with Cole Seams a couple minutes ago, and that failed miserably. Because he couldn't even cite his sources correctly. So, to conclude this diatribe here, Cold Slabs are not a phenomenon throughout the world. All the subduction zones around the world have their own unique morphology and their own unique geology associated with how they exist and why they exist and where they exist. Look at the Cascadias, for example. There's some cool stuff going on up there. Creationists don't talk about the Cascadias because they can't just pull a quick little five minute diatribe out of the results and blast all over the internet. It's too much work to actually read and understand what's going on here. That's why no one talks about anything but this one fucking image. Well, the fact is that 4,500 years ago approximately, there was a flood where the fountains of the deep were broken open and a process known as subduction happened where the crust of the earth went down into the mantle and created mountains and earthquakes and catastrophic plate tectonics. And we would predict that those cold slabs of rock would still be there today. Did creationists predict this? Because from what I'm finding, creationists saw published literature, stole it, claimed it as their own wonderful idea, and predicted nothing. Only those who deny the facts will deny this evidence. Hey Bob, you remember the other day you were asking me what the definition of irony was and I said, ah! 